My name is Julie Coker, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Resurrection. We've delighted you've joined us online for what is the final sermon of 2020. During Advent, we've been looking at different Christmas carols in our Thrill of Hope sermon series. I hope you've enjoyed it. Today is the last installment of that series, and the Christmas carol we're looking at today is We Three Kings. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, praying for your Holy Spirit to be among us, apart but together as we worship your holy name. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. you join me as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
As I mentioned earlier, today is the last Sunday of the Thrill of Hope sermon series, and the carol we're talking about is We Three Kings, written by John Henry Hopkins in 1857. The original title was Three Kings of Orient. You may also know it as We Three Kings of Orient Are, or perhaps The Quest of the Magi. At the time Hopkins composed the carol, he was serving as the rector or clergy of Christ Episcopal Church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He wrote the carol for a Christmas pageant in New York City. The carol is based on Matthew 2 and not only speaks to the birth of Christ, but takes us all the way to his death and resurrection. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, in the Message Version, says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship, a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth, we are on pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified. And not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him, Bethlehem, Judah territory, the prophet Micah wrote it plainly, It's you, Bethlehem, in Judah's land, no longer bringing up the rear. From you will come the leader who will shepherd rule my people, my Israel. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east, pretending to be as devout as they were. He got them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, Go, find this child. Leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word, and I'll join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. Then the star appeared again, the same star they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod, so they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. For many of us, this is a very familiar story. As a result of Christmas carols and the Christmas shows we watch, our various traditions, the way we remember this story may be a bit skewed when compared to the biblical version. The story I read refers to the men as scholars, and they were. We don't have a lot of backstory on these visitors from the East, but they were most likely the king's personal advisors, astrologers, readers of signs and omens, familiar with the Jewish scriptures, definitely the best and the brightest. And despite the title of this character, of this carol, the Bible never actually refers to them as kings. A more accurate title would be Magi or Wise Men. And we really have no idea how many. The song talks about three, but that's most likely because there were three gifts given. There were at least two, but beyond that, we really don't know. I know many nativity scenes, including my own, includes three wise men each offering their gifts to baby Jesus in the manger but it's doubtful they were at the actual birth of Christ. 
Epiphany, which is January 6th, marks the day Jesus was baptized and commemorates the wise men bringing the gifts to the baby, to the new king. There are others who believe Jesus may have been as much as two years old when the wise men made their visit. But regardless of when the visit took place, both scripture and carol speak of the wise men coming from afar from a great distance. Their reason for doing so is not really spelled out, but they were compelled to worship this new king. They would have been familiar with Jewish scripture. They knew of the prophecy of Micah, but what was driving them to make this trip? And God later appeared to them in a dream For whatever reason, they recognized the importance of the sign and didn't hesitate. They set out with joy to worship this new king. This tells us the birth of Jesus wasn't just important to the Jews. It was important to all. And what about the gifts they brought them? I don't know about you, but I rarely give gifts for future use. In fact, really just the opposite. I have a three-year-old granddaughter and I'm always checking the packaging uh, to see what the recommended age was. I don't wanna give her something that she's not going to be able to use right away. And even with my adult children, there may be something that's specifically for summer, but I certainly wouldn't purchase something that couldn't be used for years. The gifts gifts from the wise men, however, symbolized things to come and weren't really for the baby's use at all. The first gift mentioned is gold. Certainly not what I would think of as a gift for an infant. The carol says, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Gold I bring to crown him again. I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus left heaven. Left heaven to be born a human infant on earth. In John's gospel we're told, in the beginning the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. The word that John is talking about is Jesus. Jesus left his throne to be born a human infant, completely helpless and relying on his parents for survival. Jesus was fully human and fully God. The wise men knew Jesus was a king and they came bearing gifts that were meant for a king. And just as the angels appeared to the shepherds, the lowliest, now we also have the wise men, Gentiles, offering gifts fit for a king. And not just any king, but the king of kings. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. The carol speaks of the second gift. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owns a deity nigh. Prayer and praising, all men raising, worship him, God most high. So this second gift seems odd to us too. Frankincense comes from the bark of a tree species native to the Middle East and Africa. It's burned as incense and, I'm told, has a strong, beautiful aroma. In Exodus 30, God instructs Moses to create a pure and holy incense using pure frankincense. So not only was this a very expensive gift appropriate for a king, but it is also associated with ceremonial worship of a deity which means it seems they understood the newborn king 
was also God. The third and final gift is myrrh. The carol says, myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom. Sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. Myrrh is actually a sap of a tree native to the Near East. It's not only an anointing oil, but also a medicinal tonic. It's still used today in a number of ways, actually, but in Jesus' time, it was used to prepare bodies for burial. This is a foreshadow of Jesus dying to save us. Again, not only were the three gifts meant to honor Jesus as the King of Kings, but they also pointed to Jesus as a sacrifice, a pure and holy offering to God for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus was born to die. God is our creator. He gave us free will, and right off the bat, we pretty much ruined that and were kicked out of the garden. But God never stopped loving us, will never stop loving us, and he had a plan. I can only imagine what the angels were thinking when they found out Jesus would be born a human infant. It's so unexpected but so like God. He surprises us again and again. In my own life, it has happened countless times. I'm sure you can relate to that as well. This year has been full of the unexpected. And on the surface, it can seem very bleak, full of disappointment, fear, suffering and anguish. This year has not gone as planned, dare I say, for any of us. But we are never in control, despite what we tell ourselves. 2020 has been a great reminder of that. God is in control. And just like he had a plan all those years ago, he also has a plan for your life and for my life today. Jesus was born into a dark world, very humble beginnings, and certainly not what anyone would expect. And yet, the shepherds, the wise men, they didn't question it. So many of us grumble this time of year. Why does the Christmas music have to start so soon? Why is the Christmas section up at the department stores already? It's too early for all of this. Yes, there's a commercial side to Christmas, but it doesn't have to be that way for you and me. Is it ever too early to worship the king? The wise men reacted to the message they'd received by setting out right away with joy what a wonderful thing for us to do as well. God, God keeps his promises. He is faithful. He is trustworthy. Christmas, the birth of Jesus, is just the beginning. God came down from heaven to live among us so we could know him. He died on the cross for each one of us, his saving grace for a people who did not, who do not deserve it. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 says this, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to fear of dying. 
We also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Christmas is a wonderful time of the year, perhaps the most wonderful time of the year, as that other song goes. But there's so much more to this story, from creation to when Jesus returns. This is God's love story to each one of us. Life is difficult, make no mistake about it. But God made us resilient. He calls us to persevere. And he most certainly will give us more than we can handle, for it's then that we hit our knees and turn to our creator. God has a plan for each of our lives. It's rarely what we have planned. It's so much better. As I said before, Jesus was born to die. He has paid our ransom, not because we deserve it. We certainly do not. All of it, the birth of Christ, his ministry on earth, his death and resurrection, it all happened because of love. Will you pray with me? Holy God, each year, many of us have unexpected life events taking place that change what our Christmas celebration may look like, and this year is certainly no exception. But while our plans may have been altered this year, the fact remains, Jesus came to earth as an infant, God with us, Emmanuel, and in that there is always joy, always hope, always peace. His ministry on earth was, is, and will be like no other, for we know God. He was born to die for our sins, an incredible, extravagant, mind-blowing love. And on the third day, he arose, our resurrected Jesus, conquered death, offering life to each one of us through his saving grace. May we embrace that, God, and hold on to it in our hearts, making it a part of who we are and how we live our lives, not just at Christmas time, but throughout the year. May we, like the wise men so long ago, set out with joy to worship Jesus the King. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we move into a time of communion, I invite you to use your own bread and juice as together we celebrate this meal and remember the sacrifice of Jesus. May we come to the altar confessing our sin, opening our hearts, and professing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. On the night he was betrayed, he was gathered with his closest friends for the Passover meal. He took bread, gave thanks and praise to the Father, broke the bread, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, giving thanks and praise, he gave the cup to his disciples and said, take and drink, this is my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. From the final verse of today's carol, glorious now behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, heaven to earth replies. May each one of you be filled with joy as we enter the new year and may peace abound in your life as your cup overflows with God's abundant blessings all honor and glory to God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>